scary climate news. Natalie et al, the Polly et al, in uh, Nature, the most prestigious journal in the world, academic journal, they've stated that more than half of known tipping points are, are now active. Um, I'm sure most of you understand tipping points are these climate things that once they have, once they are, are started, once we have achieved tipping, we, we encounter irreversible outcomes. And that's the fundamental of what I'm talking about today. This image down here of, of the Greenland ice sheet, um, this is just one example of tipping occurring. These are ice canyons in Greenland. This is about a mile inland when I was there in 2007. Um, the melt, they thought the melt was extreme in 2007. It's uh, far exceeded extremeness since. So the collapses that are now active, the tipping systems, the earth systems tipping that are now active, Arctic sea ice, Greenland ice sheet, boreal forest, permafrost, Gulf Stream, Amazon, coral, West Antarctic ice sheet, parts of East Antarctic ice sheet. Um, this image here is, is one of the last wild beaches on South Padre Island. This was in uh, 2015, 2014. Beach is all eroded now. Uh, get to that in just a minute. I got two images of the same thing in there, the same um, same um, uh, content too. So uh, permafrost melt is the first thing I want to talk about. Um, this is per what permafrost melt looks like most of it. Uh, it's in southeastern Alaska on the Glen Highway. Permafrost uh, can be a thousand, can be thousands of feet deep. It's loaded with organic material. There's more greenhouse gases stored in permafrost than um, exist in our entire sky. Uh, and all of fossil fuels that we have burned and that remain uh, in the ground. We are seeing a, a massive melt, 2.3 gigatons of CO2 equivalents, which is methane and carbon dioxide, being emitted every year. Um, it's on average, this work by Natali uh, and her team, um, I, there was 75 different researchers who worked on this project. Um, that they found they didn't have enough data to, to, to determine what the trend was today. They know it's increasing, but they just couldn't get the statistics on it because they've only got 14 years. So what they did is they, they evaluated the terms of the average annual over the period of 14 years, 2.3 gigatons. If carbon dioxide was stable, uh, if the permafrost was stable and sequestering in um, 2003, which it it very likely was, um, then that means that the amount today is far more than 2.3 gigatons to get that average over the 14 year period of 2.3, which means that it's completely plausible that we could be emitting seven gigatons of carbon dioxide and methane uh, from permafrost today, which is about what all of transportation globally emits every year. So this is major, major tipping point. It's actually risen to the, our most important issue with my nonprofit, whereas we were looking at, at uh, uh, um, ice sheet collapse and sea level rise uh, just last year and before. Um, Arctic sea ice is the next one I'll talk about. Um, it's, it's happening. Uh, the loss of Arctic sea ice is, is uh, very substantial. Um, we have experienced in 2012 and 2017, we experienced uh, sea ice levels that were basically uh, ice-free conditions at the end of summer where the Arctic um, around the coast, all the way around the coast in the Arctic Ocean were open to all shipping traffic. Uh, it wasn't for very long of a period, it's just beginning, but still it's one of these major, major things that's happening. What's happening is, is we're getting from the Atlantic and the Pacific, warm waters are moving in to the Arctic. Uh, literally, this what this one paper uh, was, was talking about here by um, Polly Acob. The, uh, it's called the Atlantification. Warm Atlantic waters have moved a thousand miles across Northern Russia. 
to where they've never been before. At least we have no records contemporarily. Um, Pacification is happening too. This is where you've got waters moving up through the Bering Straits in Alaska and Siberia. This little point, we've got all this warm water. There's this uh, circumpolar circulation that goes counterclockwise around the North Pole. So the water comes up through the Bering Straits and then heads east north of Alaska through the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. 70% increase in warm water influx into the Arctic uh, over the past decade. Um, another thing that's going on is, uh, is this warming hole. This is um, very straight here. This is the Beaufort Sea. This black line is the Arctic uh, sea ice uh, average. I can't remember the period, but this warming hole, see how the warming extends up underneath the edge of the Arctic ice? When the ocean warms up, um, it's actually the, it's the, 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 the heat is moving underneath the sea ice too and eroding the sea ice from surface warming, not just these mid-level warm waters from Atlantification and Pacification. So we're losing Arctic, Arctic sea ice all over the place. Here's a good example. See, all around the Arctic, you can get through, this is the Northwest Passage here, you can get through the Northwest Passage and go all the way around the Arctic. Um, warming, this is, uh, what is this, 2017. 7 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. See this dark charcoal gray area down here above Alaska and Canada? That's the Beaufort Sea. That's where this warming hole is. Um, 7 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit, just astronomical warming in the Arctic Ocean. When it does, it moves a lot of that heat over land and complicates warming on land. Um, it is permafrost melt. Uh, there's 5.8 billion acres, billion with a B, acres of permafrost across the northern hemisphere. For scale, the U.S. and Alaska total 2.3 billion acres. Um, the scale of this is, is, is just amazing. Arctic sea ice, here's where we are today. Um, first of May, we're below the record. This uh, red line here is the uh, 2012 record minimum. Um, 1979 to 1990, these records only go back, these are satellite records of Arctic sea ice extents, the area covered by sea ice. They only go back to 1979, 1990, and you can see those years were all uh, in the, these gray areas are the averages. They're all in the averages or actually, you know, above the high end of the averages. When you look at Today, the last 10 years, everything is below the average. We've really moved our sea ice um, coverage, decreased, dramatically decreased. This is, this is a better way to look at it also. To see. The winds can blow sea ice around, um, but the volume, that is something that we've recently learned how to calculate. And when you look at the volume, look at this over here, our sea ice volume is between two and four, whoops, two and four um, uh, uh, thousand cubic kilometers uh, at its minimum in uh, late summer. Traditionally, it's between 15 and 16,000 cubic kilometers. An incredible amount, sorry about that, of, of reduction of sea ice. Okay, how are they, how are they doing this? Part of it doing this with satellites and, and um, submarines, but they they they've got they've gone even even more than that. They've gone back to um, uh, 1901 and using ships in the golden age of Arctic exploration uh, when the ships were first starting to break through the Northwest Passage, and they were doing all kinds of science. This golden age of exploration, scientists were rock stars back then. And they made all their measurements, ice sicknesses, sounding depths, water temperature, water salinity, pH. And what they found is that we have this extraordinary collapse in Arctic sea ice and the subsequent um, heating of the planet. There's a feedback. Uh, what about feedback slide? Uh, feedback. Ice reflects 90% or thereabouts of the sun's energy back into space. Water absorbs 
90% or thereabouts. So when we lose the ice, we get, it's like seven times more heating on earth than if we had ice. It's called the ice albedo feedback. Um, one of those tipping points. When we get down to zero ice in late summer, the rest of the ice, the ice volume, it will be at a point, probably a point of no return. There will be so much heating in the Arctic Ocean at that time that we will not be able to ever recover any substantial amount of sea ice, even in winter. And this is the thing, the water will get so warm, it's like the North Atlantic. Uh, if it were for the Gulf Stream, which is another tipping point, um, if it were for the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic would freeze over. Uh, 10, 12,000 years ago, one of the leading theories now, or hypotheses on um, European migration to the United States was that they walked across, or they took their boats along the ice edge where it was safe, where it wasn't across the open ocean. Um, back during the last ice age, uh, when the Arctic froze over, when the Gulf Stream was shut down, um, and the North Atlantic shut, shut down and froze over. So Greenland, Greenland discharge has increased 700% since the, since the 1990s. A lot of it is because of dirt on the ice. You can see, I've got another picture or two here, the, the ice, when the ice melts, the ice sheets melt, it's rough. It it's, creates all these little pockets about the size of your thumbnail that have these little razor sharp ice edges on it. And the, ice, the, the dust doesn't wash away. The dust is heavier than the water, it sinks to the bottom of these little pockets. And it's what you get is this ice, the dirt all over the ice. Um, this is about a mile inland from a place that I went uh, called a point six six D name near Kangalusawak um, on the west coast of Greenland. Uh, in 2007, um, the Alilisat Ice Fjord is the largest ice sheet discharge in the world. Um, this is what happens uh, when you get, sorry about that, when you get ice sheet discharge, um, when you get all this melt, you lose a lot of the melt down through moulins, these holes, these ice drains, they go all the way to the bottom of the ice sheet. That, that can be uh, in the melt zone, two, three, maybe even 4,000 feet thick. It's melting every year now, uh, several hundred miles to five to 600 miles uh, up on the ice sheet. Um, it's an incredible place. So what happens is you get this water underneath the, the ice sheet, it lubricates the ice. It can actually literally float the ice sheet. It can float thousands of feet thick of ice. Because remember, ice is more buoyant than water. When you fill these moulins all the way up almost to the top of the ice sheet in these massive melt events, then that's basically that ice is floating in water. It can literally lift up off the, these, the, uh, the bedrock by inches, uh, which dramatically decreases uh, uh, friction and allows it to flow through these ice streams much more fast, much more quickly to the oceans. Greenland, 700% increase in discharge since the 1990s. Just phenomenal. And uh, just one of these tipping points. It, this is a graph that shows mass over time, 2002 to 2020. A uh, little gray bar is, is um, where we lost our grace, our first gravitational satellites. Um, and we've got the new ones uh, up now. And the... Uh, decline of the Greenland ice continues. This is a moulin. You don't want to fall on one of these things. This is one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. But remember, see how rough the ice is? Um, it, it's, it's very frightening, but it's, it, it was not, to my wife, I say this, it was not as frightening as a 5,000 foot deep hole in the ice would seem. Um, or not actually as dangerous. This is uh, Camp. See how rough the ice is. Um, uh, camp was actually down below this mountain right here, and um, they wouldn't let you camp on the ice sheet, which is kind of cold anyway. Um, but just an incredible place. You can see this is the little sad ice fjord. No, this is a Kangalooswak ice fjord. Um, this is about 25 miles inland. This is 30 miles inland from the edge of the ice. Um, uh, 2012 peak heating record. Um, this is a Google image. If you've got Google Earth, you can go see for this, see for this yourself. See this for yourself. This um, melt pond down here is more than a thousand feet across. The brown is all dust. It, the dust, a lot of it, doesn't wash away. And back to the albedo feedback. 
ice reflects 90%, up to 90% of the sun's energy back into space. And dark water, dark things absorb up to 90%. Seven times more heating is happening now during these periods when all the snow is melted off and we're melting the base ice and we're revealing all of this dirt from ancient times. It could be this dirt easily be thousands of years old. A, a lot of it comes literally comes from Siberia, flows halfway across the earth. Um, phenomenal stuff going on. Boreal forest collapse. Uh, this includes high altitude forest. Um, I've done a lot of work on pine beetle, pine bark beetle across North America. Uh, 96 million acres. Um, the reason the boreal forests are similar to high altitude forests is that literally when you get up eight, 9,000 feet uh, in Colorado, in the lower Rockies, you've got a almost identical climate to the Arctic. Below, hang on just a second. <coughs> Below tree line is like a boreal forest when you get up close to tree line. Above tree line is in, in, in the Rockies, in, in the United States, in the lower 48, it's virtually identical to tundra in the Arctic. So these two areas are very similar. The uh, forest are being killed by very similar mechanisms. Mostly it's a beetle attack, although there's a lot of uh, insect and disease. 96 million acres that have been killed across North America. Uh, That's actually 2015. I believe, by the way, and it's it's uh, surging again. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, Jasper National Park. Uh, this is part of the uh, additional insect attacks. See where I'm running my cursor? These very light green uh, leaves, those are aspen trees. Uh, many of you know aspens are supposed to be a beautiful, rich, uh, dark lime green. This is from a um, fly larvae called a uh, leaf miner. They get in between the, the layers of the leaf and eat all the chlorophyll out. It doesn't kill immediately, but after four or five years of getting your chlorophyll eaten out, um, if you were a tree, a lot of the times the trees die from uh, other um, stressors, uh, from drought or from other uh, insect or disease attacks. Taki Mountain National Park. Love that one. This is Rocky Mountain National Park. In 2009, 2007 was, was the first year that this came to my attention. It's when we were doing our normal camping routine across the Rockies three weeks in the summer. All these red forests killed by pine beetles. Um, literally our, our greatest treasures, some of our greatest treasures. Um, natural, very natural occurrence. Very noteworthy, worthy of our respect and study, uh, but understanding that they are natural and that they, but their causes and what comes after the attack is the important part, the tipping. Um, now the pine beetle attack, it's this one beetle that was responsible for 1998 to about 2010, Dendroctonus ponderosiae, or the, pine, the mountain pine beetle. A lot of different species of this little grain of rice sized beetle, 10,000 of which can attack a single tree. They turn red the second year, just like when you leave your Christmas tree out in the backyard uh, and forget to recycle it, it turns red come about May. Same thing goes on, except it's the next year when they turn red. The following year, they kind of turn brown. Uh, after the third or fourth year, all the needles start to fall off. Um, spruce beetle is now taking over the pine bark beetle, the mountain pine beetle, has literally eaten most of its preferred tree, the ponderosa pine and the lodgepole pine uh, across western North America. Their populations are decreasing now. There's only about a million acres of new impact uh, the last couple of years versus at their peak in the late 2000s, it was seven to nine million acres per year. So we've got different beetles. They're not quite as aggressive, but they're surging now. Uh, you know, until we cool it off, this is not going to stop. This is Sequoia National Monument. Incredible place. It's just south of Sequoia National Park. Um, these are giants. 
they, uh, this one back here in the background, this one was killed by pine beetle. All these guys laying on the ground, they have been cut to prevent tourist mortality. They were killed by pine beetle. Pine beetle is not supposed to kill sequoias. They're pine bark beetles. They're the size of a grain of rice. Sequoias have bark that's two feet thick. The little beetles don't have a chance. But here we go. We're getting the most hardy trees being killed by natural occurrence because of warming. All the way to Denali. A little hard to see here. There's scattered amongst um, the, uh, the spruce here are, are spruce beetle attack. Um, all the way up into Alaska. Um, it's uh, predominant across North America. There's 96 million acres, the size of New England, New Jersey, and New York combined. Uh, an incredible amount of, of forest have been killed. All right, on to South Padre Island. Barrier Island collapsed from sea level rise. This is one of the last remnants on the four wheel drive beach. Uh, about 18 miles, I think, north of the end of pavement on South Padre Island. This was in 2015. 1984, Padre Island National Sea Four Seashore. This is seven miles past. This is our favorite place to go on a two-wheel drive. You can drive down on the hard-packed low tide. And when you get to where the, the sand below the high tide mark starts getting too soft. You stop and you pull up into the soft sand. That's as far as you can go in a two wheel drive, even though it says four wheel drive on the beach. That's, we, we went down there, we spent a lot of time down there. Look how big the beach is uh, compared to what I'm fixing to show you. That's me when I had hair and I used to fish a lot. Now I go take pictures. See how big the beach is? It's just incredible. It was a death march to get to the dunes from the water. Um, today, oh, here we go, another big one, uh, was it 2003, 35 miles um, down the four-wheel drive beach. Incredible. The sand was so soft, you could go about 15 miles at our tops. It was uh, a toil. Uh, all right, so here we go. Don't try this at home, kids. Your mechanic will disown you. Uh, driving through salt water is not a good thing for automobiles. This is uh, King Tide, South Padre Island, in uh, May of 2019. The beach is gone, uh, and now the tide is eroding into the dunes. April 2014, this is one of the first biggest tides that I witnessed. Um, the first one was in 2013, when for the first time ever, Padre Island National Seashore was closed due to non-storm high tides. This is a dune berg, a couple of dune bergs down here. See this, this angle here? That's called the angle of repose. That's what happens when the surf eats away at your dune feet and causes dune bergs to slide down into the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. I think I got another one. Real good example. These dunes have just, these literally massive blocks of sand. Have, have, have had their feet eaten out, become unstable, and slid down into the surf. This is, uh, any of you have ever been to Snoopy's at um, the uh, JFK Causeway, Corpus Christi? This is their parking lot during King Tide. Um, it's here. This is a graph that shows a tide chart at, uh, let's see, is this uh, Port Isabel? Uh, I think it's Port Isabel. Um, Santiago Pass, um, 53 times, June 2018 through May 2019, the normal highest tides of the year, the sunny day high tides, see them right here, um, and, and there's some in through here, they were above two and a half feet in elevation. When you get above two and a half feet in elevation on South Padre Island, that's when you get into the dunes. 53 times the last year, year ago. Uh, the non-storm non tides were eroding into the dunes on South Padre. Normal is zero times per year. Uh, you know, this is why I try to spend so much of my time down there. Got to get down there soon, you know, 
going to take my mask and camp on the four wheel drive beach because it is king tide season. You can see here are some more dune bergs. In between the dune bergs and right here, this is where dunes have been completely eroded away. Um, there used to be dunes. There's only one row of dunes left right here. When you get down further down the beach, down there, way down there, there's the, the dune fields extends further inland, but some places the dune field is not very deep from the shore. And they, in these places, the dunes have been completely run away. Sea level rise is another one of these things that it's like, science is great, but science has limitations. Statistics cannot accurately portray a rapidly increasing trend if the trend is not a part of the natural variation of the data set. Like with climate change, we have progressed beyond natural variation of our past climate. Basically in the last 10 years when all of these tipping systems have initiated and what you can see here is that typically NOAA uses the entire tide record back into the 45, back in World War II, to calculate the average sea level rise here at Port Isabel, four millimeters per year. Look what's happened in the last 10 years. This is a sea level rise rate of about 10 millimeters per year. The beach disintegration threshold is about seven to 10 millimeters per year. We are right on the threshold. The evidence that I'm documenting down there is, is real. The beaches are disintegrating. Um, Rockport, same thing, last 10 years. Corpus, same thing, last 10 years. I think I missed one. Uh, Port Mansfield, same thing, last 10 years. Massive sea level rise, triple what NOAA's long-term rate is, and it's because of the statistical thing called non-stationarity and date. So how are we going to, to reverse the irreversible? This is one of the really cool things down on South Padre Island. This is, these, I've got a series of these. They're created by a local down there who picks up all of these. These are all disposable bottle caps. These are all disposable lighters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Creates these extraordinary pieces of art out of them. So how do we reverse the irreversible tipping points? Tipping points are basically earth system collapses. Permafrost melt, Gulf Stream, forest collapse, barrier island disintegration, all these things, and, and, and many more of them, they are quasi-geologic, they're physical phenomena. They they are it's called uh, they have bifurcation, they have multiple stable states. This bifurcation thing means that there's multiple stable states within these systems. And what happens is when you approach the limits of the stable state. You know, with, with our climate, we get too much warming. Um, the Gulf Stream collapse. Um, when you get so much more freshening of the North Atlantic, um, that the water stops sinking, then uh, that's, uh, you get shut down in the Gulf Stream. I mean, we're starting to see it happening now. That is the initiation. Now we're in the initiation period. We're freshening the water in the North Atlantic from uh, Greenland melt. And as it gets fresher, it sinks less. The, at one point, it will sink so little that the Gulf Stream will stop flowing so far north and we'll get this return of really cold temperatures. Because, you know, England really is uh, the same elevation as, you know, the Bering Straits as, as Alaska. It's supposed to be really cold. If it were not for the Gulf Stream, it would be. When we lose the northern extents of the Gulf Stream, that's one of these tipping points. So when we have a tipping, we lose Earth system services. Uh, permafrost stores partially decomposed organic material for hundreds of thousands of years. When it thaws, all that decomposed partially decomposed organic material begins decomposing again very rapidly and gets released. So we lose the services. We lose the services that are provided from the forest of the far north, from all the animals of the far north and all the insects. Um, I already talked about the Gulf Stream. Uh, the beach, the beach protects the dunes, the dunes protect the barrier islands and the barrier islands protect the mainlands. These earth system services are vitally important to our advanced civilization. 
it without them, we will have what's basically unrecoverable scenarios. Uh, the Amazon is lungs of our planet. Ocean acidification destroys the primary productivity of plankton in the ocean that create the oxygen we breathe, that sequester carbon that the fish depend upon for our humans to eat, for the oceans to be productive. So now tipping begins and ends. It, it begins like with the Gulf Stream, like with permafrost starting to melt. It ends when those systems become um, unrecoverable, when the Gulf Stream stops flowing, when Antarctica collapses. Um, water boiling on a stove, that's a good one. When the bubbles start to appear on the bottom of the pot, that is the beginning of a tipping initiation between two stable states, between water and water vapor. When the bubbles start to rise, that's water vapor being released. That's boil the boiling process beginning. If we can stop, if we can turn the heat off on the stove before the boiling commences, we can reverse the boiling activation. These tipping points are very similar. Because these things are related to abrupt changes, we've got to reverse them. They're, they're now the most important thing. Future emissions, they limit future warming. What we've got to focus on now, I mean, f limiting future warming is awesome. That means that we, we don't have to take as, as many greenhouse gases out of the sky. The tipping has been caused by greenhouse gases that are currently in our sky by historic emissions. What we have to do now to ensure that these tipping initiations that are now active reverse and go back to their stable state that our advanced civilization evolved with. What we've got to do is remove carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from our sky, or we get to endure unrecoverable outcomes, which is never a good thing. West Antarctica, really, really crazy thing. West Antarctica is one of the very few instances where we have modeled reversal of collapse and how this happens is as the oceans warm, the oceans in Antarctica is a good, a good example. Air temperature, most of Antarctica is not melting because of air temperature, it's still way too cold down there, but the oceans are warming. The oceans get underneath the ice sheets and the ice streams that are discharging ice from Antarctica, and they, they melt from below. This, you know, just think if you had the bottom of your melt sheet, ice sheet melted out, how unstable would you be? It creates this mass and destabilization that creates thinning, makes the ice sheets flow, flow faster. That's what is causing the collapse of Antarctica. It's caused by ocean water, not air temperature. So the modeling that's been done, it says that to reverse tipping in Antarctica, the same thing goes for Arctic sea ice. All of that pacification and Atlantification that I talked about earlier, that's warm ocean waters coming from the Atlantic and the Pacific that did not used to be in the Arctic. To reverse collapse of Arctic sea ice in Antarctica, we've got to reverse ocean warming. To reverse ocean warming, we have to decrease our current temperature down somewhere close to, if not at or below, our pre-industrial temperature so that our oceans can cool off enough to reverse tipping. If we don't reverse tipping, we get unrecoverable scenarios. And I said earlier, we don't want to do that. That would not be good luck. So we do this, we can do it with nature systems, natural systems, earth, uh, forest, agriculture, oceans, if we can keep them healthy, if we can enhance their health, oceans, Ocean fertility enhancement is one thing that we can do by planting kelp. Um, we have vastly degraded ocean fertility and because of, of overfishing. Fish make fish poop. Fish poop fertilizes the ocean. We've taken away all the fish poop. If we create kelp forest, fish will congregate, fish will thrive, create more fish poop, create ocean, uh, enhance or restore ocean fertility. Ocean fertility is, is, is one of the massive ways we can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but it takes time. Forests, 
if we could limit warming, if we could keep the beetles from killing all the forests, if we could keep Am the Amazon from collapsing, you, all, you guys all heard about the Amazon uh, last winter, um, Amazon summer. Um, you know, the, the bad news from down there, that was just one in a string, 2005, 2010, 2016 with our last super El, El Nino. We had three 100 year or greater uh, uh, droughts in the Amazon, and each one increasing more. 2016 was the worst one uh, ever seen. They temporarily reversed the flow of carbon from into the Amazon to out. They made the Amazon a, a carbon emitter for a short time. The, the uh, tropical forests are such um, massive, fast uh, biologic uh, creatures that they, they turn over organic material so fast. They, their growth rate is so fast that they, the reversal only lasted a few years. And actually the, the 2016 reversal, hopefully it's reversed by now. I haven't seen any new publishing on it. But as the scientists say, is, is these things are, are temporary events. However, they get more extreme and closer together, the more warming we have. So if this isn't climate change, if this isn't a collapse of, of the Amazon, it will be soon. So we can't take all of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that we need to take out in order to reverse warming. We've got to take out between 10 to 20 gigatons per year through 2100 to make, to achieve 1.5 C. This is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said. We can get maybe five gigatons per year from nature systems. The rest we've got to take out with industrial pollution treatment technologies. That's where this World War II Gato Baleo class submarine comes into this discussion. If you look down here, this says air conditioning equipment. They didn't have, you don't have air conditioning on submarines. It's way too cold down there. What the air conditioning does is it takes the carbon dioxide out of the air. This was a potash lime uh, technology, very simple technology to remove carbon dioxide from the air that they had on submarines in World War II. We have that technology today. We're scaling it. This is carbon engineering in Squamish, British Columbia. Uh, right now, carbon engineering has partnered with Occidental Petroleum to build a 1 million ton per year CO2 removal machine, a sequestration machine in the Permian Basin uh, to produce literally carbon negative oil. Very likely to be carbon negative. It, it, at the minimum, it'll be carbon neutral. So right now, we are building these very simple machines to take carbon dioxide out of the air. What we've got to do is scale them. The scaling is, seems like a massive problem. 10 to 20 gigatons. We've got to remove 1,000 gigatons just to meet 1.5C. 1.5C, though, tipping points complete their initiations and go unrecoverable. We literally have to get down below 1C. Um, I'm very fortunate to have worked with Sierra Club uh, over the last year in developing uh, our new climate policies where we adopted 1C as the dangerous limit, less than 1C as the dangerous limit to warming. The reality is I really wanted to go down below 0.5C because 1C we know is dangerous. We know that a lot of our tipping points have initiated in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, warming was about 0.5C. We need safety factor. Climate science doesn't have any safety factors. Climate science is what it is. It is. We need safety factors. We need to be down below 1C. So we got 1,000 gigatons we've got to remove from the air. We emit 40 gigatons a year. 1,000 gigatons, a lot of gigatons. We got to move, that's to make 1.5C. We've got to remove a lot more than that to get down below 1, to get down below 0.5C. We'll get there. We're moving in that direction. Yay. We're at 1C. The quantity we treat 116 gigatons of human sewage and potable water every year in the United States alone with very simple pollution treatment technology. The technology is here. It's, 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 it's mature. It's not new. It's being developed to the scale that we need to get to, to create a reduction in our current temperature today. 
We just need the motivation to move on. And so that we can get to that thousand gigatons, 1500 gigatons, 2000 gigatons that we need to remove from our atmosphere in time to reverse warming so that we do not encounter unrecoverable scenarios. And that is my presentation. Um, I will have this, I did not get this up on the website. Oh yes, I did, it's on the website. Um, by the end of the meeting, I will have the link up. Sorry, I didn't get that up. I uploaded it, I didn't put the link up. By the end of the meeting, I'll have the link up. I have lots and lots of technical backup. 